Welcome to Ask Girl Anything. This is the show where your questions make the show, and without your questions, I don't have a show. This is for December 2023. Merry Christmas, happy holiday season. It is upon us again. I cannot believe how fast life moves. Just to give you a picture of how fast life moves, in 2017, when I was, I guess, 57 years old, um, I started a YouTube channel. You know, I, I, YouTube says I started in 2006, but that's actually when I joined YouTube. And then <clears throat> the next couple years, I didn't really do anything but watch people on YouTube for a long time. And then I got a droid in about 2010 and put up a couple really scary videos of me playing drums and recording myself, which wasn't very good. And then I got an iPhone. And then I got a DSLR camera for work. And I started messing with making some videos in 2013, 14, 15, one-off Vic Firth things. Not very good, but... You know, me trying to do something. I had a recording studio all this time, but I didn't really do it. In 2017, I've told this story many times, I was in a transition. And during that transition was the time when I started making YouTube videos just for myself and for fun. And I went from 33 subscribers at the beginning of uh, 2017 to the end of 2017, right at the end of December, having just about 200 subscribers. And <clears throat> I won this drum cover of the year contest and off I went. And that's when I got into the drum community and that's when the drum community found me really. And from 2017, December 2017 to now, I've picked up 7,800 subscribers. Let's just round it off. So I have now reached the 8,000 subscriber plateau. Thank you all who are subscribers. Thank you all who watch my videos every day. Um, I am so encouraged. This is why I keep doing it. And I've told many stories about why doing videos have been life to me the last few years. I've talked about the four words, walk, breathe, rejoice, and play. And I play a lot. I have a lot of fun. Um, you guys make it fun and you guys keep me in the game. Now, I will tell you, the last couple months, I've been spending more time doing things on the weekends with my family and little excursions and trips with my wife, and I've been having a harder time keeping up on my normal output on a weekend, but um, even that, then, I really haven't really missed many days, as you all know, and I've got so much old content that I call alternate take content that I'm putting some of that out, so... Don't be offended when you see me in my hat <laughs> or playing something from a couple years back. This is my way of basically keeping the, the churn going and keeping me on the YouTube stream and keeping you guys happy because a lot of you guys look forward to the videos every day. So I appreciate that feedback and I will continue to try to keep a good output of videos every day. With that said, I have a lot of questions this month. Again, a um, couple uh, shout outs, some subscribers who sent in some videos of their drum kits and their studio space a little bit. So I'll be featuring some of them this month. By the way, those of you that sent in videos, I will be sending you a pair of sticks. I just don't have a secretary and it's been a really busy month. November was a really busy month month for life and work so but I will be getting them out at some point of course with the Christmas mail it's going to be a little bit longer and waiting but don't worry you'll eventually get your pair of sticks because I promised it to you so that's going to happen too a um, couple other things I want to say I in this 8,000 subscriber count number you know I've made a lot of friends and I've made some really interesting friends. Um, and I try to feature them often. One of the new friends I made is a guy named Jeff Wald. And I want you to check his channel out. He is a great drummer. Um, 
he's a Berkeley grad. I don't know if he's a Berkeley graduate, but he went to Berkeley. He ended up in Nashville for a while. He's got a beautiful studio in Tennessee. He's not a Nashville session guy. Um, I'm not saying he didn't try. I'm just saying he's not. But if you watch him play, he could have been because he's a great drummer. And we connected because of the John Robinson video where I interviewed John Robinson. Interviewing my heroes has always been something I wanted to do. Um, that's just that's just me because I love talking to somebody about drums. Anyhow, Jeff saw the the um, JR video and I commented on one of his videos because I follow him and he connected the two and we talked offline. That's really kind of what I'm into. I am actually into talking offline with a lot of you guys. So I have a bunch of friends here that watch this show all the time. You know who you are and you've got my number and we'll talk and connect on the phone periodically. And that's kind of fun for me. So um, that's drum community. And a lot of you have told me that this show is kind of like drum community to you. Um, I was just talking to Jim Huey the other day, Jim Flies too. And um, he said to me, it's kind of like, you know, going to the drum shop and having a hang. And that's what I've always wanted to do is have that drum shop hang experience in my studio. So many of you know this. That if you're dropping into town for some reason, let me know and I will gladly meet up with you. I'm hoping to meet Tate Berkey in, in, in person. He's playing some shows in Florida. I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but we are going to try to make that happen. So Tate Berkey's one of the guys I want to meet up with who's around. And you guys know I love Tate's playing. He's a great drummer. Check him out. So Jeff Wald, Tate Berkey. Um... And all you guys, all the crew. Anyhow, let's get into some questions. And then at some point, I'll drop in some of the videos of the drum kits to kind of go with the questions, so to speak. Okay? So let's let's just drop right into this show. Uh, the first question comes from Drummer Boy 38305 Hey, Earl, by the way, I watched your video till the end. So what brand of 42-strand snare wires do you use, and do you believe all snare wires are created equal? Now, this was on my Ask Girl Anything, Pearl, Fiberglass Toms, Brass, Aluminum, Brass or Aluminum, Click Tracks, Deep Sounding Heads. I think this was the last show. By the way, I don't remember, because that's just me. So let me say it this way. I don't think all snare snares are the same. But sometimes generic snares do work. My 42 strand snare wires on um, this snare, I'm not, this is not this snare drum. <laughs> I'm pointing at it like it's the Black Beauty. On uh, my Black Beauty snare drum is a generic 42 strand. It might have been a duplex 42 strand snare wire set. Remember that duplex used to make the 42 strand snare wires. So it might have been duplex. But it also could have been Gibraltar, because Gibraltar makes a 42-strand snare wire set. But um, I've used Pure Sound. I like Pure Sound. Um, I on my Black Beauty six and a half by fourteen, I have a set of Canopus. That's the um, Japanese um, drum company, Canopus. They're kind of like a custom company. They make a 30 strand wire, a 24 strand wire, I think, or a 20 strand wire. Anyhow, I think I got, I think it's the the vintage snares is what I got. Vintage snares, and I think it might be 24 strands, but I'm not sure exactly. But um, Canopus makes some great snare wires. Pure Sound makes some great snare wires. Um, I tend to like... Uh, the, the brass looking ones, that's, or the copper looking ones, I think they might be better, but I don't know if they're better. Um, I do know that a ratty snare on the bottom of the snare drum is not a good sounding snare drum. So I usually do change them out to something that's a straight snare wires on the bottom and they're not bent up and broken. But over time, snares do break and I've played plenty of snares with broken wires or dropped one wire off. So, but not all snare wires are the same, but if they're in good condition and they're brand new, they could sound fine. By the way, the 42 strand 
generic snare wires that I use on that Black Beauty work just fine for that drum. So I do like it. So thanks for uh, asking that question, Drummer Boy. I appreciate it. My next question comes from John Fine Gold, 1512. And he asked, this was on Darlene, the Led Zeppelin tune. I played a few Led Zeppelin tunes this year. I'm stretching out. Um, Earl, getting the lead out. Love it. How many times do you have to play a song typically before you have it nailed? That's a great question because I never think I have the song completely nailed, by the way. Um, many times I'm trying to get as close to the record as possible, and I still don't get it exact. But I try to be true to the groove as close to the groove as possible, as close, close to the fills as possible, but there's always a little bit of me in every song. Now, typically, and I would say this is probably 95% of the time, I do not go past one hour to work on a song. Many times, probably half the times, I spend less than a half hour on a song. So if the song is simple enough, something I know well in my head because I've heard it a billion times and I pick it up usually within the first 30 minutes, I get the song down. And that's from sitting down and playing it the first time. I record everything. Matter of fact, I was talking to Jeff Wald about this because a lot of guys, and I was talking to Jim Flies too about this too, um, a lot of guys will practice the song and then they will record the song. And my thing is, I don't have time to do that. And that's probably why my output's so great, is that I will sit down, put the cameras on. I've learned to put two or three cameras on. That's the, that's the tough thing. Early on, I used to just do it with one camera. But I'll put two or three cameras on, let them roll, sit down and start playing, even the hardest of songs, and I'll play and play and play until I get one. So... That's kind of my, my, my deal, how I do it. What I found is most of the time, once I get to that one hour mark, I'm not going to get any better. So I get it to a place where I've rehearsed it, played it, played it, played it, played it, and it doesn't get any better. An example of that is when I cut the Steely Dan tune Asia, which is not exactly like Jeff, like, um, not Jeff's, Steve Gadd's drum part on Asia. It's not exactly like Steve Gadd's drum part on Asia. Um, the fills are me trying to be Steve Gadd. But I remember when I cut it that day, I probably went an hour and 15 hour, 20 minutes. And I went back to take eight, which was in the first hour, which got the take that was the one I used on the video. So if you get a chance, check out the Asia video um, in my Steely Dan. By the way, I've got playlists for albums I love to play. Steely Dan is one of those albums I love to play. I mean, I will tell you that that album, the Steely Dan Asia album, is what opened my ears up to some of the greatest studio musicians in the world. Prior to that, I knew of Hal Blaine because I read on records. I loved Chicago, so I was a big Danny Serafin fan. But Steely Dan's Asia was the album that basically opened my ears up and said, hey, there's a lot of guys that play on a lot of records that are great drummers. And that's where I heard Steve Gadd for the first time and said, well, that's the same guy who did 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover on Saturday Night Live with Paul Simon. That's that Steve Gadd. I connected the dots. So Asia has got some of the greatest drummers in the world on it, by the way. So be it Bernard Purdy, OK, um, he's one of the one of the greatest drummers ever playing it. Um, I think he's got um, Home at Last, the halftime shuffle. That's the, you know, the pretty shuffle thing. Rick Murata playing Peg. Um, I've got the news. I believe that's Ed Green. Now. Many guys don't know Ed Green, but Ed Green is an amazing drummer, okay? And he's a guy that has played on a lot of the songs I've played over the last few years. I've done some Barry White songs. I've done some 
Helen Reddy songs. I've done, I don't know, tons of songs that have great drummers on it. Ed Green's on some of them. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing when you start to look back and see who the drummers are that were on Asia that I've played the songs. I've played a lot of Bernard Purdy. Of course, I've played Rick Murata. I've played some Steve Gadd stuff. So these guys were all influences on me because of that album. That album kind of, oh. So I played the whole Asia album. So I have it in a playlist. And then I played the whole Katie Lyde album. That's mostly Jeff Beccaro, by the way, with a little Hal Blaine in there. I played the whole Royal Scam album this year, which is all Bernard Purdy, with two Rick Moranas. So there are some great Steely Dan tracks. And Steely Dan loved to use studio guys. So I'm working on Pressel, Pressel Logic, which is Jim Gordon mostly, with some Jeff Beccaro and Jim Hooter in there, too. So... You got those guys, it's studio drummer madness. All I'm saying is, I love listening and knowing who plays on the greatest songs that have been on pop radio. Check these guys out. These are the guys you want to be listening to. So, major kudos to all those guys. But Steve Gadd's Asia, well, it actually was Peg. I was in a band, we played Peg. Didn't realize it was Rick Murata, but when I heard Asia, I just went crazy. That was the album I remember buying and just looking at every every song had a different drummer on it. It was amazing, amazing album. Anyhow, I don't know how I got down that rabbit hole, but it didn't take me much to do that. Um, so I guess I answered the question, John. Somewhere less than an hour usually from the time I turn the cameras on and sit down and play this song for the first time a lot of times, till a finished product. And I find I don't get a better product past an hour. Um, every once in a while I have a song, gotta come back another day and do it. It does happen occasionally, that's the, the 5%, I'll call it. But with the amount of output I do, you can tell I don't really throw away songs, which ticks guys off, by the way. Um, I just did a Van Halen song, and. Some of the guys didn't like it. They were like, well, you didn't really nail it. You didn't really, I didn't spend, a, I didn't spend two hours on it. No. And I didn't want to come back the next day. I felt like, no, I wanted to play rock and roll. I don't want to play me. Sometimes I want to just be me too. That's part of it too. So I try to honor the song. I try to get the song in the spirit of the drummer, but I'm not always exact. That doesn't make people happy all the time, by the way. Um, and I, I've kind of learned that. Now, to address that, and I'm not going to name this guy, I, I did a song by America called Tim Man. Okay? I'm not sure if Hal Blaine played this one or America's Drummer played this one. Um, I forget his name. He was a Tam endorser back in the day. But I got one of those strange comments, you know. It was kind of like, he just said, you play it wrong. It always cracks me up when I get these kind of comments, you know? So, you know, my, my normal line for these guys is, you know, well, play the cover for me and let me see how to play it right. You know, that's, that's always the thing. Playing a song right is always open to interpretation, just so you all know. So, but I, I got, it was so comical. I kind of put it, I just copied it, you know? And then I, then I got after I wrote back to him and said, show me how it's done. He basically, um, he basically wrote back, no, I don't. But you, you have to play it. You have to playing it incorrectly. You have to playing it incorrectly. And all I could say back to him was, if you say so. So it's funny how guys think like they know how to play the song. Like maybe I did play something wrong, but maybe I didn't. Maybe I played it the way I heard it, you know? Part of playing being a cover musician in a cover band, all those years of playing covers, playing weddings, was you kind of play like you play. And then you kind of hear the song and you kind of find the pocket. And the other musicians, you're, they're playing like they play what they heard, and then you find the pocket. So playing exact is really not easy. But I will tell you, I have been trying way more this last year to get closer and closer to the record on things. So if you put me up against a record, I'm probably 90, 92% in most of the time. Now, one of the things I've learned playing to records 
And this is studio musician stuff. This is like Jim Gordon's influence and Rick Murata's influence and Ed Green's influence and Jeff Picaro's influence is these guys play very simple bass drum patterns, lock it in. One on the kick is common, very cool two and four. They got their own thing lope wise on the hi-hat. Okay. They play fills and they come out and they don't hit a crash cymbal. It's amazing how many of the songs in the seventies you had came around the kit and you didn't smack the crash. You got back on the hi-hat and you're back in the groove again. Listen, listen, listen to some of that music and see what you hear. So I've been hearing that so much, but when I was young, I used to always come around and punctuate with a crash. So dugga, 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 bam, you know, but that's not necessarily how those hit records were made. So I've kind of learned that. Now today, the rules are different, you know, drummers play lots of crashes, punctuate lots of crashes, but there was something to that. And I think I read this in an Al Jackson Jr. article in Modern Drummer, where the stack sound was about not playing crashes because crashes could offend women listeners. That's what they said. The high-end crash offended women listeners. Anyhow, something to think about. You can see how deep in studio drumming I like to get. So, um, all right, let's take the next question. So, let's see where we're at. Okay, next question. This is from Eric O. 2948. Good job, Earl. This was on Memphis in the Meantime. Now, Memphis in the Meantime was a John Hyatt song played by Jim Keltner, another guy who was on the Age album who played Josie, by the way. Love Jim Keltner's playing. I went for a Jim, Jim Keltner vibe on this particular kit. This is a couple years old, this, this video. So I was on the, the Walnut Gretsch kit, and I had two Roto Toms over here. And that, that was kind of a, a Keltner thing in the 90s. He used to have a one-time Tom here, maybe two floor Toms. His cymbals were a little low and flat. And then he had some Roto Toms over here. I think he still does it occasionally, once in a while. Anyhow, he said... I see you play different, uh, are all the kits I see you play on different videos yours? Keep rocking. Well, the answer to that question, Eric, is yes. All the videos that I have made have been in my studio and are me playing on my kits. So now, the interesting thing is when you have lots of drums, your kits can change. So I have lots of drums that go with this kit. This drum kit, the fiberglass pearl kit, has exactly, well, I have all eight sizes of toms, and I've got doubles of some of these toms. My Gretsch kit's got an 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, so I can have any combination of four-piece kit, five-piece kit, six-piece kit, or seven-tom kit. You know, with four toms up top, no, six tom kit. So four toms up top and two floor toms. So that kit could be quite big. This kit is big, usually. I also have a little maple Gretsch kit. And I've got three roto toms I throw in here once in a while. I've got an octobon. I got, so I've got some stuff and I got lots of different snare drums and all kinds of different cymbals. That was kind of me wanting to be, well, actually owning a studio and wanting to be a studio musician. I felt like I needed certain gear to have, get certain sounds on certain times. Now, my favorite cymbals are Peisty, but I have Zildjian and I've got Sabian hanging around too. So my kits can look any different kind of way. They're all my kits. So if you're watching me play in a video, most of the time, all the time you're watching me play my drums, and all the time you're watching me play my kids. So, yeah, that's the answer to that question. Thanks for the, thanks for the question, though, Eric. All right, the next question comes from Stephen James 2022. Uh, great cover, some awesome sticking. This was on the Angel of the Morning video, Juice Newton drum cover. Can I ask you how you added, um, can I ask how you added description and we're able to upload the cover with the original track with copyright. Have you changed the track pitch? All right, Stephen. This, this is a common question I get a lot. Um, here's what I have found out. 
if my videos get through the copyright, I, I, I never change the pitch of the songs except two times in my career here on YouTube. One time was All Right Now by Free, where I changed the pitch of the song to get it on because I spent so much time on the song I wanted to get it on. And the other one was 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, and it would not get on, and it kept they threatened a copyright strike to me if I, if I uploaded it. That's what I learned about private mode. So I put my videos on YouTube always in private mode. Now, if you put it in unlisted mode, you can watch them and others can't see it unless they have the link. But unlisted mode will get you into trouble. So always start in private. And if you find out the copyrights are okay, you're not going to get strike, then you move it into unlisted mode or public mode. That's a little YouTube trick. I use it all the time, by the way. So I know when I release a video that I'm not going to get a copyright strike. That's the key to the whole thing. Now, as far as my descriptions, I've been adding a lot more to my descriptions lately on my videos, and I've just been going into Wikipedia and polling. So Wikipedia could be wrong, by the way. So um, there could be something wrong in my descriptions, but most of the stuff I say is about album results and that kind of stuff. Occasionally I put musicians in the videos description if I can. Um, and then a lot of times I'll give personal anecdotes about why I did the video or who was in the video or what inspired me to do the video and that kind of stuff. Mm. So I've never been copy, I've never had a copyright problem with the Google wording in there. Plus YouTube would know it's Google because YouTube is Google. They say nothing about that. Um, as far as the copyright, I kind of explained how I get around that. So, no, I don't use the pitch shift. Uh, I don't find that to be good for me. Now, some guys do pitch shift just because they want to make sure they get it on. But I don't worry about it. I just cut it. I have a folder. Actually, I have a playlist of YouTube block covers. You can't see it. It's a private folder. It's on my Folder struct, I'm actually private playlist. It's on my playlist structure in YouTube. And it's got videos that I can watch if I want to watch them because they're in private mode, but I can't release because they're blocked. I have about 12 videos in there presently. Every once in a while, one of them comes out. And when it comes out, I post it. Like um, Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles, which was a very special song. Um, it had to do with my son. I even included my, some of my son's footage of him playing guitar, even though he wasn't really playing guitar on it. It was us jamming in the studio. Um, and I released that, I think, last month. And it came free from the unblock. It came into the unblocked status. When a video goes to unblocked, it shows up on my computer as it's unblocked. And I go, oh, I can release it. And I do. So don't throw away those videos that get blocked, you drummers that do YouTube. Keep them in a playlist. Keep them in private mode and wait for the day when they get released because they will one day. And then you release it like 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, which took seven years, but or actually took five years, technically. I've only been at this technically six years. I'm in my seventh year now. But um, yeah. Keep them in a playlist, pull it out when it gets unblocked, and then put it out. I've got some really nice Linda Ronstadt stuff, two songs that I can't release. It's just what happens. So uh, just don't get discouraged. And if you want to check it before you put it up, I know guys that do that. My friend Ken, the tired drummer, does that. It takes too much time for me. I'd rather spend the time on multiple cameras and all that stuff. And the amount of output I do, I'm not worried about if one gets blocked. Most of them don't get blocked today, believe it or not. And some of them they will share the revenue with you now. The next one comes from somebody named Tina Thetber, 2403. And she said, how long did it take you to learn to play like that? This was on Love Takes Time Orleans. You guys found some interesting old covers this month. Um, is there sheet music for drums or what? That's another great question, uh, Tina. Um, 
I get that question a lot. I'll get somebody who'll write me and say, hey, do you have the drum transcription or do you have the drum chart for a song? They think I write stuff out before I play. I don't write anything out, by the way. Now, I can write things out, and I write myself cliff notes for gigs occasionally, but for the most part, when I play covers, I just sit here and learn it by ear. That's all I do, just like when I was a kid. I'd sit there and just play drums over and over and over again until I work out the parts. And by the way, that means that sometimes when I'm doing covers by myself, I'll have 20 tracks, but they won't be complete tracks. They'll always be like the intro and like I hear something. Oh, I don't want Let's go back and do it again. Oh, now I hear that part. I really try to get the front end of the song as tight as possible because the front end of the song, you guys only listen for like a minute. So if I get it right in the front end of the song, you think I did great. And if you want to hear me play crazy, it's usually at the end of the song. It's a little secret. For those of you that never get past the first one minute of a song. Now, I don't always get past one minute of a song either, unless it's something I really want to see. What makes people get past one minute of a song, I think, is the sound of the song. So if the song sounds good, you might stay in it longer, which is one of my goals is to make my drum sound as good as possible, make the music sound as good as possible to keep your ear engaged in, this, in the song. But... Early on in the song, I try to get it right, especially the intro fills and that kind of stuff have to be right. By the end of the song, I know I'm going to lose some of you, so if I lose the complete trying to be exact thing at the end, that's where I usually lose it. It's usually the end I kind of do my own stuff somewhere on the ending. And then sometimes I play past the ending, which is always fun. You know what I mean? Which is what I did on The Worst That Can Happen, by the way. <laughs> that's... I kind of played the tune, and then at the end, I got into this little groove thing, you know? So maybe I'll put a little bit of that ending on the back end of this video just so you guys can see me playing a little bit today. Or maybe I'll put it on the front end. I don't know. When I cut this, I'll figure that out. All right. So um, how long did it learn me to take – how long did it take me to learn how to play drums this way? 48 years. Yeah, I'm at 48 years. <clears throat> I'll be 49 next year. Getting closer to 50 years. Um, I don't have it down. I'm still learning, still growing. I'm still getting better at some things, getting less better at other things. It's funny how as you get older, some of your facility kind of goes away, but your head is way more in the game. So I'm way more in the game in the music today than I ever was in my 20s, where I might have had more chops, but um, I think my playing is much more dialed in because I'm way more aware of what I'm doing all the time. I think that comes with age. So that's how long it took, took me to play it. Now, having music is nice. Some of you guys use music all the time. I know that. I just don't for the most part. If you see me with a piece of music, it's a drum chart. It's a big band thing. And I'm trying to read that music. Reading big bands different than playing a cover of a pop song that they that some guy charted and playing it note for note. I have no desire to do a pop song note for note. I may look at the chart to get some kind of crazy fill or some kind of crazy groove occasionally because that's helpful, but I'll put that away. It won't even be there when I'm doing the song. And I can think of one song. It was the Living Color song. Um, um, cult of personality where I was having this problem with the three, four bars in it. And I looked at the chart and I pulled it up and I used that chart to play that song. That's the only time I can remember doing it. And maybe one of my early Jackson five songs, I found a chart of, um, I don't think it was ABC. It was one of those other ones. It was very helpful because Motown's charts have a lot of odd bars in them, believe it or not. They're not written in four, four. Like, the, the groove, basic groove is 4-4, four, four, but then they'll throw in these odd bars. So if you don't know where the bars are, it's nice to have a chart to help you. And, I mean, these studio guys had charts when they played these songs down. That's kind of the beauty of working in the studio. They had an arranger would arrange the song, and they'd put the chart up. And that's how they got it so fast they could read the music. So reading is really important, so I'm not going to dismiss it. But I don't write charts for every song I do. 
if you watch me do a song and you say, hey, can you send me the drum transcription? It's like, no, I can't. It was in my head and I played it. That's how it works. So, but thanks for the question, Tina. Thank you very much. The next question from Bebop Fantan 2672. He asked the question, I thought Pearl was wood fiberglass. Have you ever played a Tam of Fiber Star kit? Uh, Pearl does make a wood fiberglass kit, but this kit is fiberglass. This is completely fiberglass. It's not the phenolic shell, it's the fiberglass shell. They made a phenolic shell concert tom kit, apparently. Um, Peter Chris apparently had a phenolic shell too. Um, the popular concert tom kit was the Pearl fiberglass ones, um, mid 70s till about 1980. And then they stopped making fiberglass drums somewhere in the early 80s. So 80, 81 catalog, I guess. They did introduce concert toms with fiberglass, so maybe it went to 82. Um, the wood fiberglass was a way of taking that um, Luan mahogany shell and putting fiberglass inside of it to get a better sound and make it a stronger shell. So the wood fiberglass is a whole different thing than fiberglass. Now, Tama's fiberglass was made for a couple of years. Um, I had a friend in college named... Um, Tony Parente, and Tony Parente had a Fiber Star kit, and then he sold it, and I helped him buy a Gretsch kit. I'll never forget that. That was a lot of fun. He bought a black Gretsch kit with a sonar mount on it, so uh, that's another story for another time. I haven't seen Tony in, gosh, 15 years probably, but he had a, he had a Tama Fiber Star kit in college. And then he sold that and got the Gretsch kit. But that's the only time I ever played one, I think. Um, I've played Fives drums. Fives are different fiberglass than Pearl. And, of course, there's the Blamere shell drums, which are different than the Pearl fiberglass drums and the Fives drums. And um, I know there's a company called Jenkins & Martin. He didn't want to sell me a six-inch Tom, by the way, but I got it. Thank you. For telling me I had to get the Pearl one. Thank you very much. Even though you could have made some money off of me. But you didn't. They make drums in the spirit of Blame Air shells. And their shells are very different than the Pearl Fiberglass. So Fiberglass has been around since the 60s. And I have played almost all of them except the Blame Air. So I'd love to have a Blame Air kit. But maybe one day I'll meet up with Jim Waggy and play his kit. He's got a beautiful Blame Air uh, Jenkins and Martin kit, which is in the Blamer style. So, Jim, if you're watching and I ever get to Kansas City, I would love to play that kit. That would be fun. So, all right. I got a couple more questions. Let's interject one of my studio uh, uh, videos and introduce this guy. Um, he's a regular on my channel all the time. His name is Greg Oneoff. And Greg Oneoff is going to show you his drum kit. And then I've got a question from Greg Oneoff. Morning, Earl. This is a front shot of my mainly Mapex drum set. It originated as a four-piece set, that gold color that you see with the 10-inch rack tom. And that gold one over on the left-hand side is the floor tom. It's a 12-inch. It was the floor tom. And then the snare, 12-inch snare that came with it. And that kick drum is an 18-inch kick drum. Okay, there's the snare, Mapex 12-inch snare. Rack toms, the four rack toms that you see here from left to right. The one on the left is a 13-inch star. Next to it is a 10-inch Mapex. Next to that... 12 inch Mapex. Next to that one is another 12 inch Mapex. Now, right below the 12 inch Mapex rack tom, which is originally a floor tom, is a 12 inch pearl tom. The snare drum is Mapex 14 by 8. And then over here, this one. That's a concert tom, an orphan drum. I don't have any idea 
what brand it is. It's wooden, uh, real pretty wood. Maybe it's mahogany. I don't know. And then this is a 16 inch floor tom. Symbols are mostly Sabian. This is a 16 inch Sabian. This is a Zildjian, 24 inch Zildjian. Real, it's quite old. This is 22 inch Sabian ride. This is a 17, no, 18 inch. Oh, maybe it's seven. I don't know. It's a Sabian also. These are the Sabians are all V8s. 16 inch Sabian. And this is an old Pasty um, Ludwig brand, but made by Pasty that came with a 1966 Ludwig set that I got rid of not too long ago. Then the hi hats are the Pasty hi hat on top. Uh, Sabian <clears throat> below that. So, 10 piece patched together down here in my basement. Thank you, Greg, for showing us your kit today. So, Greg's question is this He was watching me play Hideaway by Chicago on Chicago 8. So, on Hideaway, he goes, I noticed the stand for your China just to the right of you. What brand is it? I have one just like that, but I don't know what brand it is. Mine has a boom arm on it with a counterweight at the end. So I believe the stand you are talking about is one of my original Pearl stands that came with my Gretsch kit. And it was made in the late 70s. It's got um, little uh, nylon bushings inside of it. And the original arm had a tilter on it that broke. There was a kind of a wild tilter on the back. Somehow I got this piece that fits it, and I think it is a pearl piece. But I'm looking at it right now. It's pretty beat up. It's 40-plus years old. Um, I would never take it out on a gig, but playing it in the studio works fine. It holds the cymbals fine. Um, so if you have one that looks like that, it's probably a pearl stand. Pearl, you know, it was either a pearl stand or a pearl knockoff. Because those were the ways they were making stands in the late 70s. And then by the 80s, you started to see more um, detailed work on the, the parts, you know. Now, one of the things you'll notice about my stands is they are pretty gnarly. And none of them really match anymore. I think this is a PDC kind of. Um, that stand is, I got a Gibraltar piece with a Yamaha bottom, and this one's got a pearl. This is a pearl stand, I think. This is pearl, except the tilter might not be pearl. And this is a Yamaha boom in a Yamaha stand, kind of, well, kind of, sort of. And this is Gibraltar-ish. So, I kind of just throw parts together. I've got... Most of my stands are just parts I've thrown together over the years. Um, the only time I ever bought official stands was with that Gretsch kit, which were Pearl. And most of those stands, I have the bases, but the booms and stuff kind of broke over time and I lost them. So um, I hope that helps. And I had one of those booms with the counterweight on it. So it's probably a Pearl, an old Pearl stand. Thanks for the question, Greg. And thank you for sharing your drum kit. I have one more drum kit to show by the end, I promise. All right, let's get back into this. Um, the next question comes from Charlie Contrino, 1626. He says, I'm a David Lee Roth fan. Um, you sound good. This was on Dreams by Van Halen. He had a nice comment. Thank you for that. He said, are those coded ambassadors as Rezo heads on the Gretsch kit? And the answer is yes. I actually have a set of brand new coated ambassadors on the bottom heads. And you're saying, well, why do you have coated heads on the bottom? Well, number one, they used to put coated heads on the bottom of a lot of these drums. My original Gretsch kit came with two coated ambassadors on it. They were called Gretsch Permoto Permatones heads. Um, I wish I had those bottom heads. I played those heads over years. Everybody started switching to clear bottom heads Back in the 80s, it became kind of the, the way to do it. 
And in 2000, one or two, a friend of mine, who was a Remo endorser at the time, um, he got me some Remo heads. And I bought a set of Remo clear ambassadors for the bottoms of those drums. And for the tops, I don't know if I got emperors or what I got that day. But those clear ambassadors stayed on those drums from 2000. Gosh. I guess from 2001 or two, all the way to last year. And when I got the Evans heads from another friend of mine, who's an Evans endorser. Um, when I got those Evans heads, I decided to take the clears off and put them in a pile to use on the concert tom kit. So for a while, I had some new clear ambassadors, which were really, really old Rezo heads on these drums for a while. Because some of the, the clear ambassadors kind of go a little bit faster than the coded. Anyhow, long and the short, my plan is to buy another set of clear ambassadors to put on the bottom of my Gretsch kit and then move all the bottom heads on my Gretsch kit, which are all brand new coded ambassadors, and put them on the tops of the Gretsch kit. So one day I will buy clear ambassadors again, or I will buy clear G1s or Rezo heads from Evans, which I might do that. And then I'll put the uh, coded ambassadors on the tops. That's a possibility that could happen, but um, not anytime soon. Now, what I do have is my head combination on the Gretsch kit right now is a vintage ambassador coated over top of a coated ambassador bottom on all the drums except the eight. I don't know what's the bottom of the eight inch drum. I don't think it's a, it's not a clear, I don't think it's a clear. It may be a coated ambassador. I'm not sure. I'm not positive about that right now. But um, anyhow, thanks for that question. That was a good question. An important question, too. Uh, let me get back into my iPad. For some reason, it does not want to go. All right. Thank you, Charlie, for that question. Really do appreciate it. Let's, let's do this. Um, I've got, I think I've got one more question. And I've got another drum studio I want to feature. So the next one is Drum City Bob Studio. He was gracious enough to send me a YouTube link to his um, video he made of his studio. Drum City Bob is another guy you want to check out. Pro drummer, been probably playing as long as me, or close to as long as me. Um, great drummer. He's got great chops, got beautiful drums. You're going to check this studio out and check out his drum room. It is amazing. So check out Drum City Bob's drums. Bob here. Thought I would share some of the drums and equipment in my studio. Love your channel and everything you're doing for the drum community. Thank you. What you'll see over here is my snare wall. Some of my favorite ones are on this rack. I've got a DW Collector's uh, Cherry Kit. Over here is a Krabi Auto Kit uh, in walnut with cherry inlays. Um, this particular kit is a 60s Rogers. You'll notice it's the Rogers script. It's got a champagne sparkle finish. This drum kit over here, 100 year old drum kit. I've got a Ludwig Legacy Mahogany kit. And you'll notice I got the 1931 UFIP uh, symbols on it, which are real jazzy, light sounding. I've got a bottom kit in the yellow Vista light. And behind the bottom kit, I've got a 1969 gold sparkle. Uh, Hollywood Ludwig kit. Thanks, Earl. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Drum City Bob. I, I really am impressed by your kits. I love that Craviato kit you've got. That Craviato kit is killer. But you've got a killer DW kit, too. So, I mean, a lot of cool drums. In that and The Ludwig stuff, too, you have. The, and your snare drum collection. Forget about it. It's cool. Very cool. Gear is cool. Love gear. Right? It's love talking gear, too. So I owe you a pair of sticks. I owe Greg one off a pair of sticks. I owe John Breeze 805, 805 Breeze, a pair of drumsticks. I will get that out to you. All right, my last question comes from uh, Brian R. He kind of wrote me, and I'm, he's going by Brian R. because he wrote me an email. And it was about Slingerland Concert Toms. And he wrote, hello, Earl, I hope you're doing well. I just bought a 73 to 78 set of Slingerland Black Chrome Concert Toms, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 24-inch kick. 
I have no stand. They are clip mounts. Do you suggest using rim mount, the rims mounting system? I feel it would be hard to find those stands and costly. Thank you for your time. Now, you all know that watch me with this kit. You know that I have upgraded the, cop, the, the Pearl clip mounted toms, except for my six and eight. By the way, this is a clip mount, okay? Right there, that's a clip mount. All these drums came with clip mounts, and I actually have three stands worth of clip mounts, so I could put them on clip mounts. But here's the problem with clip mounts. They only tilt one way. There's no side tilt. There's no twisted tilt. There's no funkiness like I've got on these. This is Pearl 7.8's hardware. Now, Pearl 7.8's hardware, I could have drilled for that, put the 7.8's mounts into the shell, drilled a big hole and made a big mess. I decided that the clip, four holes for the clip mount were enough of a problem on this these drums to do that I wouldn't do that. And I got rims mounts. Now, rims mounts are designed for resonant isolating mounting system, meaning the drum rings more because it's on a rims mount. Do you need ringy toms to play concert toms? No. But the functionality of not destroying the drum is why I bought rims mounts. So I could avoid having everything clip mounted down, especially the big toms. I these on the clip mount, you have no it, you basically everything gets kind of like they're kind of like uh, like straight. It's really it's really not symmetrical for me. So except over here, which I love the clip mount for this. That's because when I was a kid, my first Ludwig kit had a 12, 13, 16 with an 8 and 10 concert tom on a clip mount, a Ludwig clip mount. So the 6 and the 8 are perfect on a clip mount. Love it. Everything else on my drum kit is on 7 8 Pearl hardware on rims mounts. I think that's the way to go to mount concert toms, to be honest. It's either that or you drill the shell and you put the mount on the shell. You really don't need isolation mounting unless you want to preserve the shell. So if you want to preserve the integrity of the shell, what you will do then is buy rims mounts, and then you can take that mounting plate off, put whatever mount you want on the drums, and then when you go to sell it, you can sell it with the original mounting plate put back on. That works fine. If you had the mounts, you could actually put the mounts on the rims mounts, but you don't have the mounts. Uh, the clip mounts are a little wonky, so I don't recommend the clip mounts for the bigger drums anyhow. So I say that's the way to go. Definitely go rims mounts and make sure you've got some mounting hardware to mount them with. And that's going to be the whole ball of wax, and that will make your toms really sing and really work. So um, I'm a big fan of the rims mounts, and it's allowed me to have setups where I can do this. I can turn the tom any way I want. So, and that's really what we're looking to do here. All right. So, that being said, I think that's Ask Girl Anything. I think I covered all the questions. Um, I shouted out to some new friends. Thank you all that watched my show all the way through. Um, remember, your questions make the show. If without your questions, I don't have a show. I got to get better at asking you to buy my merch at the beginning of the show because nobody watches it to the end except for the diehard friends who probably have my merch if they wanted it by now. So, but um, I will include merch in the links to the, to the video. Of course it is Christmas time. I don't know if I'm going to run a special. If I do, you'll see me talk about it somewhere at some point. Other than that, thank you everyone who watches my videos every day and everybody that encourages me in the videos. I am so blessed to have you all as friends. Um, I'm hoping to make more friends and get some more friends to talk to. Um, maybe someday we'll do a live stream. I don't know if that's viable or not, but maybe this, maybe we'll do a, a live stream soon and see if we can get everybody to hang one Saturday or something. I don't know what a good time for a live stream is. Maybe I'll put a question up on community and YouTube and see what would be a good time for a, a live stream and we'll do it one weekend. Of course, they're all in different time zones. That's what makes it more challenging for sure. Anyhow, 
Thank you for watching Ask Girl Anything. Your questions make the show. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.